So thank you for joining us today. This is the first session of the introductory webinar series entitled uh, Monitoring Aquatic Vegetation with Remote Sensing. My name is Juan Torres Perez, and today, as always, I'm accompanied by my colleague Amber McCollum from the NASA Ames Research Center in California. So here's a course uh, structure and materials. Uh, remember that this is going to be a three one, uh, one and a half hour sessions, including the Q&A uh, session at the end. And it's going to be on July 12th today, and then on the 14th, and on the 19th again. And remember that the same content is, is presented in two different languages, in English and Spanish, uh, at two different times. Uh, and uh, please sign up just for one of them and attend just one session per day, uh, depending on your language of preference. Um, also remember that all the webinar recordings, the PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignment will be found on the uh, on the the web page shown on the screen, which is the web page for this so for this webinar, and uh, even though we're going to go over some questions and answers at the end, if by any chance we're not able to answer your particular questions, feel free to send us an email to uh, any of the of the addresses that are shown on the screen, mine or Amber's as well. So there's going to be one, just one simple homework assignment, um, and answers will be submitted via uh, the Google Forms. And uh, as with most RSET courses, uh, this homework will not become available on the course website until the last day. So on July 19 is when you're going to be able to see and uh, and, and work with the with, with this particular homework. And uh, so to, to obtain the certificate of completion, you will need to attend the live webinars, the three live webinars, and to submit the assignment on or before August 12, which is two weeks after the end of this webinar series. And then eventually you'll be receiving the certificate of completion for this uh, webinar. And as a reminder, due to the high volume of participants that we typically have on, uh, on these, usually takes about two, maybe even three months to have the certificate, certificate sent out. Uh, but rest assured that uh, if you participated in all three sessions and submitted the homework, you'll be receiving your certificate eventually. So keep in mind that this is an introductory course, but uh, we do recommend, uh, in any case, particularly for the people who are not familiar with remote sensing, to go over the fundamentals of remote sensing course, or if you have any equivalent experience, uh, uh, that also counts as a prerequisite. And again, all course materials are available on the course uh, website shown on the screen. And who knows, in the, in the future, we may even have a more intermediate or, or advanced webinar on this uh, topic, but as a reminder, this is an introductory course. Now, before we start with the webinar topics, I would like to remind you, or remind our participants, that uh, RSET, the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, is under the umbrella of the Capacity Building Program at, at NASA, which at the same time <coughs> is under the Applied Sciences uh, Program. And the purpose of RSET is to help uh, building the skills to acquire and use available NASA satellite and model data for decision support. So we provide in person, and online trainings, which are uh, intended for policymakers, academia, uh, non governmental organizations or NGOs, and other applied science uh, professionals who want to incorporate NASA remote sensing techniques and tools into their activities. We provide introductory, uh, intermediate, and advanced trainings on different topics uh, within the areas of air and, work, uh, air and water quality, disasters, uh, land. And, uh, and and also um, uh, water resources. Okay, so let's go over some of the learning objectives for for this webinar today. Uh, today, at the end of the session, uh, we hope that you become familiarized with coastal and marine submerged and floating aquatic vegetation species from temperate and tropical waters, and uh, and then, particularly with seagrass, we're going to go over seagrasses, kelp, and sargassum. 
and also to become familiarized with uh, the one of the main some of the main satellites and sensors that are used to study aquatic vegetation remotely and what are some of the typical spectral signatures of plants and algae and then towards the end we're going to go over uh, remote sensing of seagrass meadows and we're going to highlight some uh, case studies as well now um, as a background let's talk a bit about some major types of submerged aquatic vegetation and um, as you may be aware of there are many types of sab as we will call it uh, through this uh, webinar but due to the time constraints um, we will only concentrate on three types of uh, or groups in particular as i mentioned seagrasses kelp forests and sargassum Today, we'll talk briefly about each of these, and then in session two and three, we will go um, into more in-depth, uh, uh, mainly about kelps in session two, and then sargassum in session three. Now, seagrasses are flowering plants, uh, often confused by, with algae by the general public. Seagrasses evolved from plant plants about 70 to 100 million years ago, and most of them occur in shallow, and by shallow I mean less than 20 meters of depth, uh, or in sheltered coastal areas. Uh, the following, here are some, are some of the characteristics that can be used to define a seagrass. Uh, they live either in estuarine or in the marine environment, and nowhere else. The pollination, it actually, there's actually pollination and it takes place underwater with specialized pollen. The seeds, which are dispersed by both biotic and abiotic agents, are produced underwater. And seagrasses have specialized uh, leaves with, reduced, uh, with a reduced uh, cuticle and epidermis, which lacks uh, stomata and it's, um, it's the main photosynthetic tissue. The rhizome or underground stem is, an, is important. Uh, mainly for, for anchoring, and the roots can live in an anoxic environment and depend uh, on oxygen transport to, uh, from the leaves and rhizomes, but are also important in the nutrient uh, transfer processes. Now, according to the uh, categories and criteria of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, U, uh, IUCN, red list of threatened species, about 14% of all seagrass species found around the world are at an eleva elevated risk of extinction, and actually some uh, species are already classified as endangered. Now, seagrasses uh, provide a suitable substratum for epiphytes. Uh, influence ocean-wide uh, primary productivity and produce organic carbon by sequestration and interact with mangroves and coral reefs ecosystems. Other seagrass functions include maintaining biodiversity, which has a potential uh, biochemical utility, and improving the resilience of the coastal environment itself. The seagrasses are uh, part of the food web structure and act, also act as food source for a wide range of marine species. And they also provide habitat for fish and vulnerable species, uh, including uh, dugongs, manatees, seahorses, and sea turtles, and function as feeding grounds for many species of seasonal migratory birds. Even in some tropical areas, seagrasses also serve as breeding or nursing grounds for some shark species. Uh, including nurse sharks, for example. Now, seagrasses play a critical role uh, in the equilibrium of coastal ecosystems and form extensive meadows, supporting high, high biodiversity and providing numerous ecosystem services, including fisheries that support the livelihoods of millions of people are in coastal areas. And for instance, just to give you an idea, uh, about uh, several decades ago, a couple of decades ago, uh, Constanza et al. in 97, 1997 estimated the ecosystem service value of seagrasses at about $34,000 US dollars per hectare per year. And obviously this number has increased in the last uh, two decades uh, after the, the, the release of this uh, paper. Now, kelps, on the other hand, belong 
to the class uh, phi of easy, or, or are what we know as a brown algae. And so far, there are about 30 different genera described in several families. Kelps are one of the most important benthic uh, submerged aquatic vegetations in temperate seas around the world, and they only occur in shallow subtidal uh, rocky reefs. Oh, up, up to about kind of the same thing, about about 20 meters, 20 or 30 meters of depth. And each plant, plants in in quotes because uh, kelps are not really plants; they are uh, brown algae. Their lifespan is about about two and a half years, but the, each front uh, of, of each of the again plants is in quote in quotes only lasts about four months. Now, under ideal conditions, this is one of the most uh, fascinating things about kelps. An individual can grow up to half a meter a day. Now, also many kelp species are characterized by the presence of uh, pneumatocysts, which are gas-filled balloon-like structures that help in controlling the buoyancy of the structure, uh, making it easier to reach the surface of the water. <clears throat> As an example of uh, one of the one of the most important kelp uh, genera, Macrocystis, is one of the most dominant genera of kelps, and uh, and it forms some of the biggest individuals, with some of them reaching more than 30 meters in length. Also, kelps in general are uh, probably some of the fastest uh, uh, growing types of algae, and as I mentioned, they can they can grow uh, they can uh, under ideal conditions they can grow up to about half a meter a day, which is Quite amazing. Now, large kelps they act as a foundational species, providing both primary production and a three-dimensional habitat for many groups of invertebrates, fishes, birds, and mammals, among others. They're also <coughs> ecosystems and engineers, as they alter the environmental conditions, including light and substrate availability structural complexity and rugosity, and even the seawater chemistry itself. Now, they also they, they also recognize as one of the most important among, uh, and productive and dynamic ecosystems uh, on the planet. Now, in terms of human benefits, kelp uh, do provide a number of different uh, benefits, and I'm only including uh, here just a few of them. Um, they provide coastal protection in, against wave action, so they serve as a barriers against wave action. As I mentioned, they're really important in terms of fisheries and even as a food source. There are many commercial products uh, such as soap and uh, um, some types of glass that, are, that involve um, within their production, involve the use of kelps. And they're also very important in terms of uh, either recreational or touristic activities um, on the, the on temperate coastlines. And even in some indigenous cultural systems, they they have a symbolic and a spiritual aspect also that is uh, considered uh, within indigenous people. Now. Uh, kelp, as I uh, as I said, I, I mean sargassum. Uh, let's, let's talk about sargassum here for 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 a little bit. Now we'll just cover uh, just uh, a very summary about seagrasses and kelps, and now we'll we'll, we'll go over a few slides on, on sargassum. Sargassum are also uh, also belong to the to the fire feces, so they are also brown algae, and most uh, the species of, of sargassum are actually planktonic, so they live and they have a free floating uh, life. And there are a few of them that are benthic, so they live in the in the bottom of the ocean. Um, it's a, <clears throat> a fun fact: sargassum were origin originally named by Portuguese sailors, uh, who found it originally in the what's known as the Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean and uh, uh, around the uh, off of the eastern coast of the U.S. And uh, some species of sargassums they have uh, uh, very like gas-filled bladders. Kind of similar to the nematocysts that we mentioned in kelps, and these also aid in flotation. And individuals of sargassum may grow up to several meters uh, uh, in length, and there's a photo uh, there that I took a few years ago in, in around the coastline, the, the west coast of Puerto Rico. 
Now, large pelagic mats of sargassum in the Sargasso Sea, they act as one of the only habitats available for ecosystem development. This is because the Sargasso Sea lacks uh, any land uh, boundaries. And the sargassum patches act as a refuge for many species in different parts on, of their development, but also as a, as a permanent residence for endemic species that can only be found living on and within the sargassum patch. These endemic organisms have specialized patterns and colorations that mimic the sargassum and allow them to camouflage in, the, uh, their, in their environment. And in total, the sargassum mats are home to more than 11 different phyla and over 100 different species of organisms. Other marine organisms, such as uh, young sea turtles, they use the sargassum mats as shelter and a resource for food until they reach a size at which they can survive elsewhere. The Sargasso Sea also plays a major role in the migration of some uh, catadromous eel species, like the European eel and the American eel and the American conger eel. And the larvae of these species hatch within the sea, and as they grow, they travel to Europe or the east coast of North America. Later in life, the, the mature eel migrates back to the Sargasso Sea to spawn and to lay eggs. Now, in limited amounts, sargass uh, wash ashore sargassum plays an important role in maintaining Atlantic and Caribbean coastal ecosystems. Once ashore, the sargassum provides vital nutrients uh, such as carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus to coastal ecosystems, which border the nutrient-poor waters of the western North Atlantic tropics and uh, subtropics. Additionally, it decreases coastal erosion. Nonetheless, since 2011, Massive uh, beaching events of sargassum have occurred on the, uh, the Caribbean Sea from the southern until the Yucatan Peninsula. And this has affected the local fisheries and tourism, causing major impacts on the economy of all these places, which depend mostly on the tourism industry. Local governments, they spend millions of dollars yearly just cleaning up their beaches and, and shores. The decomposition of large quantities of sargassum along coastline consumes oxygen, creating large oxygen depleted zones, resulting in fish kills. Uh, decomposing sargassum additionally creates um, oxygen sulfide gas, which causes a, a range of health impacts in humans. And uh, for instance, during the sargassum inundation event in 2018, about 11,000 acute sargassum toxicity cases were reported in an eight month period, on just the Caribbean islands of Guadalupe and Martinique. Massive amounts of uh, floating sargassum also present a, a physical barrier preventing corals and seagrasses from receiving sufficient light. Uh, fouling boat, boat propellers and entangling marine uh, turtles and mammals. With every sargassum inundation, inundation event, large amounts of nutrients are transported from the open ocean to the coastal environments, and this greatly increases uh, the, the, the transfer of nutrients uh, particularly uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and its effect on marine and coastal ecosystems is still unknown. So understanding the causes and drivers of sargassum inundations is critical as they become more frequent and more massive each year. Now, during the third session of this webinar series, we will hear more about sargassum mats, their ecology and impacts, as well as specific efforts using remotely sensed techniques to monitor these events in the, in the Caribbean and the Atlantic as well. Now that we talk a little, we've talked a little, a little bit about some general information on particular uh, submerged aquatic vegetation groups, and before we go into specific sensors uh, that have been used for uh, for SAV monitoring, let's mention uh, a very important aspect to consider when dealing with underwater targets for remote sensing purposes. So let's talk about the water column and how light behaves once it reaches the surface. So within the electromagnetic spectrum, the area that we call the visibles uh, is in reality very narrow, as you see here in the left-hand figure. And it typically extends only between 400 and uh, roughly about 400 and 700 nanometers. Now, light, as light penetrates a water column, the exponential de decay of light intensity with increasing uh, water depth results mainly from two different processes, 
absorption and scattering. Absorption is wavelength dependent, and the main absorbers in marine uh, waters are algae, as in phytoplankton, inorganic and organic uh, particulate matter in suspension, in suspension, color dissolved organic matter or CDOM, and the water itself, which uh, strongly absorbs uh, red light and has a smaller effect, effect on the blue light that is shown here in the, in the, in the right-hand figure. Now, scattering uh, causes the reflection of light, and it is largely caused by inorganic and organic particulate matter and suspended sediments in the water. Now, the spectral radiances recorded by a remote sensor are therefore dependent both on the depth and on the reflectance of the seafloor substrates, such as seagrass, corals, algae, seaweeds, epiphytes, sand, etc. These two influences on the signal create challenges when attempting to use satellite data to map uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. And as you may have figured out, uh, as depth increases, the discrimination of SAB spectra and other benthic components declines. Now, as I mentioned, some of the water column components are optically active and corrections are needed to, uh, and it need to be considered when assessing for uh, submerged aquatic vegetation and other benthic components. And in reality, about 80% of the signal that is received, received by any given sensor in orbit actually comes from the interaction of particles in the atmosphere. Then there's another high percentage that comes from the interaction of light within the water column components through absorption and scattering, as mentioned in the previous slide. And then the remaining few percent percentages come from the benthic features, including the submerged aquatic vegetation. If we're talking about, uh, let's say, seagrasses, for instance, who are uh, in the in the bottom, settled in the bottom. Now, as we saw in the previous slide, the longer wavelengths are rapidly absorbed by the water itself, and there are the blue and some green wavelengths, the ones that penetrate the most which is uh, what we're seeing here in the left-hand figure. This is the main reason why we see the ocean as uh, blue waters. Now, those of you who do scuba diving, for example, may have noticed how uh, particularly at depths, let's say, of to 10 to 20 meters or, or more, most of the vibrant, vibrant colors of benthic organisms like corals and sponges and sea anemones, most of those colors are lost. and uh, and look more, these organisms look more bluish than, than other the shallower depths. And even blood at those depth, deeper zones uh, may even appear as a dark green color instead of red. It's basically because all the, red, all, all the other colors are lost or absorbed uh, in the shallower parts of the water column. Now, water is not the only component of the water column that absorbs light. Here's a graph on the left hand side that shows some of the major uh, absorption players in uh, oceanic waters. Uh, for reference, all, all of these, but the, the, with the exception of the phytoplankton, are represented in the primary uh, y-axis here. This clearly shows that, as mentioned uh, before, water absorption dominates in longer wavelengths and versus, uh, for instance, things like CDOM, color dissolved organic matter, and suspended sediments, they have their higher absorption features in the blue. And the figure also uh, usually looks uh, different in coastal waters where phytoplankton is the one that plays a major role in light absorption uh, than some of the other components. And, but independently, the the fig, both figures they show uh, the two major absorption peaks around about around 443 and 655 uh, nanometers of chlorophyll a uh, dominated uh, phytoplankton and particularly the figure here on the on the that's what is shown in the figure on the left here. Now unless uh, the, the aquatic vegetation are exposed, it is necessary to conduct uh, water column correction processes 
to estimate the amount of light attenuation and their effect on the reflection of the of the venti components, such as seagrasses or kelps or, or any other type of uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, when you're using remotely sensed uh, techniques. And um, one of the most common methods uh, is the one actually proposed uh, several decades ago by Lisenga, in the in originally in 1978, and then in in a few other papers uh, later on. And, and Senga suggested the calculation of a, what's called a depth invariant index, or DII, to remove the scattering and absorption effects within the water column. Now, later, other researchers have found that this index works very well in clear waters, or what we call case one waters, but it's less reliable in more complex waters. Let's in case two waters, waters that are more have a, a higher domin, uh, <clears throat> dominance of sediments and other particulate matter um, in the in the water column. Now, more recently, uh, Sagawa in 2010 they proposed an an, an alternative uh, method, which is called a bottom reflectance index index or BRI, which seems to work uh, better in case two waters than 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 Lisenga's method. Now, uh, other commonly used approaches include the subtraction of a deep water reflectance value uh, from each pixel, such as the approach uh, uh, proposed by Lucard and all in, in, 20, in, in 2003. And uh, other approaches are to use a logarithmic transformation and regression analysis for each band uh, of that, are, that are being used, uh, such as the one proposed by Conger et al. in, in 2006. And we we we, we could uh, provide the uh, <clears throat> a list of this reference uh, if some of you guys are interested in that. So here's a simplified illustration of the interactions of light as they uh, originate from the sun and are recorded by an optical sensor, uh, either in orbit or airborne. Uh, the labels here, uh, just for practical uh, <clears throat> reference. They refer to, uh, for instance, LT is the radiance reflected by the target. So that's that's what we want to measure. Um, LTS is the radiance reflected by the by the target that it's then scattered out of the path of the sensor. It's a radiance that sends this, that, uh, even though it is uh, reflected by the cut target, the sensor is not measuring it. Um, LS is the radiance reflected by uh, non-target substrates such as uh, sand or others. LA is a radiant reflected by the atmosphere to the sensor, also, also referred to as the path radiance. LAS is a radiance scattered by the atmosphere. LW is a radiance uh, reflected by the water column into the sensor. LWS is a radiance scattered by the water column. LWA um, is a radiance absorbed by the water column and Li, radiance reflected by the air and water interface, and Le, the radiance that is scattered into the scene by the ambient environment. So as you can see, there are many, many different factors that, that have to be considered um, when measuring or we're trying to get in some sort of a signal from um, mainly from, from benthic aquatic vegetation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about satellites and sensors typically used for studying uh, aquatic vegetation. Now, here are some considerations um, that need to be taken into account when choosing the appropriate satellite data. So, for instance, the temporal resolution of the data acquisition, whether the, the sensor acquires the data on a daily basis, uh, such as MODIS, for instance. Um, or is it on a weekly basis, or a monthly basis, or bi-weekly uh, uh, basis, kind of quasi-similar to what Landsat does? Um, uh, spatial resolution, it depends on the satellite. Uh, it could be anywhere from meters to kilometers. The spectral resolution, whether it's multispectral or hyperspectral. And where in the in the electromagnetic spectrum are the are the bands? Are they in the visible, the infrared, and the and the short wave infrared, or even within the visible? There's there there uh, depending on the sensor, there are variations of where the bands are located. The longevity of the satellite missions, uh, as we know, the Landsat has the longest record of satellite data. 
since uh, it's been uh, the the Sun's series has been in orbit since the 1970s. Um, geographical and atmospheric corrections of the of the study site, uh, as I mentioned, coastal ecosystems, all those different parameters that you have to that that, that, that we saw on the previous slide. And in general, coastal ecosystems, they tend to be relatively small, like seagrass beds, uh, or narrow, as in the case of beaches. In tropical zones, there might be more uh, cover, uh, cloud cover year-round, so there, the, potentially there are a few images to, to work with. And uh, also, is the data freely available, or are there any costs associated with data acquisition? Or even are there any future missions being planned, such as, for instance, right now uh, with NASA in, in, in particular, the surface biology and geology, or SBG, uh, and also the plankton, aerosol, cloud, and ocean ecosystem, or PACE, which are two uh, hyperspectral, hyperspectral missions that are, well, I'm going to be talking about them in a moment, and, uh, and are also are being planned uh, to uh, eventually uh, launch. Now, um, the where well, there are many differences between data from various remote sensing sources. There are some common characteristics and advantages of using remotely sensed data, and, the, and this include, for instance, the potential to monitor patterns and processes at diverse uh, ecosystems and across multiple spatial and temporal scales. Uh, scale and the availability of remotely sensed data for large regions that are uh, sometimes inaccessible. Many satellites have been in operation for a long time, and this assists in, uh, in our ability to establish landscape baselines and to track changes over time. There are consistent measurements globally uh, that can easily be compared across different regions. And there's a diversity of measurements from spectral reflectance that can be used to monitor vegetation health to, to, uh, to soil moisture and canopy data. Remotely, remotely sensed data can be used in conjunction with field-based observations, which often serve as cross-validation measures. And finally, data are mostly uh, free, at least NASA data is free, and we have open access. And uh, and that is uh, definitely an advantage, particularly when you have limited resources. Here's just just to just uh, uh, to showcase uh, some of the current satellite missions, the Landsat series uh, that are in orbit. I remember Landsat nine was uh, <coughs> put into orbit last year in in 2021. Um, the uh, Terra and Aqua. Have been around for a couple of decades. Uh, the the SOMI MPP uh, or BIRS, uh, the BIRS sensors in, in, in particular, <clears throat> has been around for about a decade or so. And then there's the uh, the European Space Station's the uh, Sentinel uh, series as well. Now we're we're very lucky to that that we that due to the to earlier air force uh, by earth scientists and the investment of uh, space agencies that we're now in a what can be considered a golden age of satellite aquatic remote sensing and this have left us with a long time series of observations and while there's limited overlap among all of the sensors listed uh, here in this table in terms of uh, spectral and spatial and Temporal radiometric resolution. It is still possible to uh, to piece information from this important uh, historical data set. Now, uh, I would encourage you to uh, take a moment to look at all these satellite missions. This is a rich uh, data set that can be used to understand uh, current uh, submerged aquatic vegetation questions and to even begin to understand how aquatic and benthic systems have changed uh, since the beginning of the of the of these different time series so take a look at this table and and have it as a reference uh, where you can see the, the different types of resolutions and and, and and temporal scales among others now as i said um, the, uh, the optical sensors in general are either multispectral or hyperspectral um, the multi-spectral ones have been the norm uh, with satellite sensors, and, uh, and the, the, the disadvantage is that there's, they're very limited in terms of the, num the number of spectral bands 
that can be used. But it has the advantage of the longevity of data sets, as in the case of Landsat and Modis, among others. And the fairly uh, high temporal resolution, which can be from days, typically from days to uh, weeks. On the other hand, hyperspectral uh, sensors uh, so far they have been uh, limited in terms of uh, different missions. Uh, here's, uh, for instance, just to show uh, Hyperion was um, decommissioned in 2017 and had a 30-meter uh, spatial resolution, about 220 different bands with uh, around uh, 10 nanometers bandwidth. And there were some missions that were uh, more specific, as uh, in the case of HICO, the hyperspectral imager for coastal ocean, which was on the International Space Station, um, but yeah, and that wasn't only limited in terms of the of uh, the different sites uh, where it uh, obtained data, but also on the temporal scale, it only lasted about five or six years. And there are other airborne sensors. Uh, for instance, NASA has the Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, Avris, and the Avris NG, or the new generation, and also the Portable Remote uh, Imaging Spectrometer, which are from flown in different uh, platforms. But again, these are also more mission-specific, and usually there's a high cost for using, uh, just for planning a mission with these. Lately, uh, there's been a development of hyperspectral cameras for um, UASs or unmanned airborne systems. And this looks uh, promising. Um, uh, in the next session, where we go over KELPS, and there's a, I have a slide that shows a couple of these uh, systems uh, for reference. So here we see uh, a comparison on how the spectral resolution of sensors may impact your analysis of uh, aquatic vegetation and why it is important. Uh, it's an important aspect to, aspect to consider when, when choosing the appropriate image set to be used. See how the definition of the specific features is lost here in this figure on the on the right hand side from uh, Rowan and Kalaska from last year. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, as we will see later today and in, in, the, in, the, in the following sessions, that doesn't necessarily mean that the resolutions like the one that the Lanza series has at 30 meters is not useful for studying uh, aquatic vegetation. And while it might not be useful for species definition, it can be used for other purposes. Now, as I said, there are two uh, different missions that are uh, planned within NASA that are uh, specific for, or that are, that are that can be applied for for ocean and coastal processes, and definitely for submerged vegetation. Phase uh, is planned for launch in in 2023, and it will have an advanced optical spectrometer, or uh, an ocean what's called an ocean color instrument, or OC. And it will be a hyperspectral uh, instrument uh, with measurements for, uh, it will be particularly useful for water quality products. So not necessarily because of the uh, the spatial resolution, which will be about one kilometer. Uh, it's not gonna be useful for, for species definition, but definitely for water quality products uh, in different parts around the world. Now, SBG, surface biology and geology, uh, is still in the initial phases of uh, development, but it will be hyperspectral in the visible and shortwave infrared. And um, an SBG is going to be is going to have a much higher uh, spatial resolution, maybe on the order of 30 to 60 uh, meters, which could be particularly useful for shallow water uh, submerged aquatic vegetation systems. Now let's go through some examples of remote sensing applications for uh, for SAB uh, monitoring. Now, spectrohadiometry or spectroscopy and passive optical remote sensing uh, generally provides information about the composition of targets uh, based on how they reflect and emit energy. Now, looking at this figure here, we can we can uh, talk a little bit about what happens when uh, when radiation hits uh, the plant leaf. Um, when the radiation reaches the leaf, it's either absorbed or transmitted or scattered by the leaf components, primarily the pigments and the cellular structure. And um, and with uh, with some of the light scattered back away from the leaf, 
uh, uh, appearing to be reflected. Now, green vegetation, including many, many different types of submerged aquatic vegetation species, uh, has an easily identifiable spectral profile because of the consistent absorbance of properties of its pigments, chlorophylls, lutein's, and carotenes. They all absorb light, uh, blue light, uh, very strongly, and they do not absorb as much as a uh, green light uh, at all. So, uh, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B also absorb red light around. 640, uh, 45 nanometers. And this produces the characteristic green, green peak uh, in the visible. That's why uh, why we see that these plants are uh, green. Accessory pigments like carotenes and xanthophylls, they also create additional absorption features in the visible that can be used for distinguishing groups or, or species. Now, increasing the concentration of any uh, pigment will reduce the reflectance across the spectrum. But we'll also do also inconsistently to reinforce and widen any associated spectral uh, features. Now, vegetation also displays a distinct and drastic increase in energy reflection in the near infrared, uh, called the red edge, uh, and the and the IR, what's called the uh, and the infrared plateau, due to multiple scattering or or of uh, of infrared light. Uh, in the leaf tissues. And the red edge and the IR plateau are, however, heavily affected also by water absorption in that region. Um, and uh, and if we go deeper into the infrared, we'll, you'll see some of the features that are characteristic of these. Now, these features, uh, in this, in the, I mean, in these two different graphs that we have here, uh, uh, from Thoreau et al. In, in 2005, you can see that there are very subtle differences in reflectance of the three main Caribbean uh, seagrass species, Thalassia, Seringodium, and Arodule. Uh, some of these differences can be enhanced by applying uh, first derivative analysis to the curves. Um, such differences may be due to different pigment concentrations or the absence or presence of, of diverse accessory pigments or even the influence of uh, epibions, um, particularly if the data is collected underwater without, without cleaning the, the leaves uh, first. Now, seagrasses leaves are often uh, colonized, as I mentioned, uh, by epiphytes and, or epibions. The co-occurrence of these in the seagrass meadows results in the spectral bias because they produce varying degrees of chlorophyll-like absorption spectra, caused by mainly uh, absorption of the blue and red light. And these graphs here show a comparison of raw and corrected spectral signatures collected from uh, with a field uh, spectral radiometer of different uh, three different um, uh, seagrass species. And the immediate effect that we can see here is the flattening of the curve. As a, a particular in the green region uh, where, of those leaves that are colonized by epibions. Interestingly, the effect may vary apparently depending on the amount or type of, of organism colonizing the, the, the plant leaves. Additionally, the spectral variation resulting from seagrass pigment composition, seasonality, and physiology of the epiphytic cover need to be considered for standardizing any vegetation index for seagrasses or for any other type of, of uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. Now, most uh, researchers usually attempt to discriminate seagrass and other substrates and, and measure the percentage cover of each of these. Here, um, <clears throat> having a good knowledge on the typical form of spectral signatures of the different types of aquatic vegetation and other uh, substrates uh, is particularly um, critical to properly assign the different classes to, to benthic maps or images. Here's a, a graph that shows some of the data that I've collected over the years uh, and uh, in the Caribbean in, and in general. And just for reference, Acropora cervicolnis is a stackholm coral, typical of shallow waters. Palitoa is a zoanthid that uh, also lives uh, generally in the same zone as, uh, as Acropora cervicolnis. Rhizophora is a red mangrove, and Thalassia is a seagrass. And 
and we see here uh, the contrast of some of the some of the spectral features um, of these. Um, even though uh, also interesting in, in, in this example, the Thalassia signature does, doesn't show the typical green peak as you see here. Um, and uh, at least in this case, it behaves more like a seagrass blade with epibions or epiphytes, um, which was, I believe, mostly the case when I collected the spectra because this collector collect, spectra collected underwater um, and the leaves were not clean before. Uh, collecting the spectra, but you see that uh, that there are some organisms like uh, let's say some corals and uh, and zoanthids are more similar in terms of the the the, the spectral signature, and uh, Rhizophora, the red mangroves, does show the, the the general or the typical green peak of uh, of uh, of green plants. Now. Here's an interesting case, and some of the data that I've collected in, in Southwest Puerto Rico uh, some years ago. There was a, there's a case of this reef, it's called Enrique Reef. And uh, just for reference here, what you see in this processed uh, image of the reef, uh, the green is seagrass, blue is sand, and red is coral. And, and the dark areas here are areas where there's, there's no data. But, uh, but I wanted to bring your attention to, to this area. This area, when, when we did the analysis, it was shown um, and there, there were some, some, some pixels here that appeared to be uh, corals. And, uh, and when I saw it and uh, with, the, with, the, with the analyst, the person who was doing the, 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 the analysis for, for this image in, in, in general, I told the person, "What well, I've been diving in that area for 20 years, and I'm and I'm I'm completely sure that uh, that that area is not it's not coral. And it turns out that this area uh, is actually a mix. Here in this area is a mix of seagrasses and this type of zoanthids called Zoanthus ociarus. And as you see, Zoanthus is also green." And this might have produced some of the confusion here uh, when uh, during the analysis. Some of the pixels were classified as coral, and most likely because in in some of them the the let's say the the, the concentration or the cover cover of a zoanthus was higher than the than the seagrass and this is why they were they were classified uh, incorrectly classified as, uh, as coral and here you see for instance the differences and in some of the some of the uh this data collected with a spectral photometer uh from the uh an extract from the pigments you see the differences here uh in seagrasses uh, the, the green one and the red one is uh this guy here the zoanthi Now, uh, there are different methods for classifying uh, seagrasses. Uh, I highly recommend a review that, that was uh, published by Hossein et al. in 2015. That uh, it's an extensive review paper uh, with a lot of data from, from more than a thousand different papers. And um, um, found some of the most common methods that are used for classifying uh, seagrasses where in particular for aerial photos, doing the manual del delineation uh, back in the days, and for uh, for satellite data, more of a supervised classification uh, or using uh, radiative canceling, transfer modeling uh, equations. And recently, uh, there's been a lot of development in regards to, to using linear spectral on mixing and, uh, and also even machine learning techniques. Uh, have become more and more common for seagrass classification. Now, uh, Schweizer uh, et al. In, in 2005 used a supervised classification method uh, applied to Landsat 7 uh, data to map seagrass habitats in Los Roques Archipelago, a national park in Venezuela, and obtain an overall accuracy of about 74% and were able to separate eight different bottom types, including dense seagrass, uh, sand, muddy buttons, buttons uh, mixed uh, vegetation, among others. They first applied the uh, depth invariant method, or Lisenga, mentioned, in, mentioned earlier, 
and found that the combination of uh, mainly bands two and three of, uh, of Landsat 7, of the enhanced thematic mapper, uh, and the, the green and red, respectively, they accounted for about 64% of the variability in, in the in the submerged aquatic vegetation biomass in, at the National Park. And as expected, and due to the light attenuation in deeper areas, the best classification methods were obtained in shallow waters of the reef, with sand and dense seagrass meadows in, in particular having a 100% correct classification. But um, the usual high heterogeneity of tropical shallow water uh, habitats like seagrass beds or coral reefs and the moderate spatial resolution of the Landsat series increases the possibility of of, uh, of this uh, reflective body of, particular, of a particular pixel to be the result of a mix in reflectance signals, kind of similar to what I showed with, uh, with, uh, with the data from Southwest Puerto Rico uh, from different bottom types. But in in we we have the, we will have the opportunity in session three of this webinar series to to listen to uh, Dr. Roy Armstrong as an invited speaker, who was actually one of the co-authors of this paper that I'm mentioning, and who was in fact one of the first one to use Landsat data to quantitatively estimate uh, seagrass biomass back in in, in 1993. Now here's data published earlier this year by Fernandez et al in the journal called the science of the total environment where they use 30 years worth of landsat data on the coast of adelaide in, in south of southern australia to study seagrass cover responses to changes in land-based inputs and in this case they use uh, field data to train the benthic classification and to assess the accuracy in the case of australia the, the main genus is uh, posidonia and the image uh, processing included an atmospheric correction first with acolyte and accounting for total suspended solids uh, using the red band of Landsat. And then using the blue and green bands to create a subset where, la where sand and seagrass areas could be distinguished. In this case, they obtained an accuracy, an overall accuracy about, of about 83 to 95 percent uh, with this processing with all lo the lower accuracy being in areas uh, with um, different periods of high turbidity as expected. Now the study highlighted the importance of analyzing different uh, temporal scales uh, from annual to, uh, annual to decadal. And, uh, and the image here shows the, the persistence of benthic uh, cover of seagrasses over time with an apparent increase in the last decade possibly as a result of changes in nutrient inputs from, from the local outfalls. Here's data from the same study that shows specifically the areas where there was either a gain or loss of seagrasses. And you can see that uh, such uh, long-term data sets are useful for following trends in submerged aquatic vegetation cover and seagrass in this case, associated with either human or climate factors. Now, um, uh, like uh, one or two years ago, a NASA developed program uh, project was conducted by a team where they explored different indices to follow potential correlations with particular environmental factors. In this case, there's a unique band combination that allows seagrass to be analyzed uh, over time. And uh, photosynthetic organisms, as, as I've mentioned, they refer to a large amount in the in the NEIR. So the NEIR band and the blue band collectively uh, allow for uh, aquatic vegetation to be uh, assessed. Now the team in this case compared the amount of NEIR and blue light uh, to make an index that is sensitive to aquatic vegetation, and this is the what it's known as the normalized difference aquatic vegetation index. And we're going to go over some of the results. The figure here uh, looks like the uh, NDAVI, uh, normalized difference aquatic vegetation index in the Chandelier Islands, and in, in this was in, in, in around at the Louisiana coast. Um, the five points, five points were selected across the islands, and the NDV, NDAVI distribution was compared from 80, 1984 to uh, 2021, 2021. And, um, and here, what we can see <clears throat> is 
that the the uh, the team were able to follow the the changes in N NDAVI through time through several decades and to even compare it compare that to the to the, the extent or, or decrease in land area as a result of uh, of different um, different atmospheric uh, events and also uh, they were able even to relate to some some of the loss of the seagrasses in those areas to other human factors such as uh, oil spills and, uh, and 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 others now the submerged aquatic vegetation uh, also suffer along the land in proximity to it and uh, it was, we they found that uh, the the SAV behind the northern and southern parts of the islands uh, were destroyed by the 2004 and five hurricanes, while the SAV behind the central part of the island uh, remained more healthy and pretty much intact. And uh, it seems to have uh, been have benefited from the construction of the of a sand berm in, in 2010. Stabilize, stabilizing its decline and even causing the SAV to recover in some of the in some of the areas. Now these images show the NDAVI index in the summer months of 2000 and to 2020, and the highest values on the index of the index show uh, shown in green here. Uh, they occur very close to, close to the islands each year. The images also exhibit the changes in, in land cover seen in the, in the previous image. The, the low land cover in the, in the 2010 image um, after Hurricane Katrina, but before uh, the sunburn placement, is particularly striking. And the images uh, suggest that the decreasing uh, NDAVI trends correspond to the loss of seagrasses in, in the immediate proximity to the islands where the land area disappears. Now, interestingly, some regions, regions relatively far from the islands have high NDAVI values, particularly in 2020. And these regions likely do not contain seagrasses. Uh, seagrasses uh, tend to only occur in very shallow regions, as we've seen. So there might be some artifacts uh, shown in some of the images, um, maybe around these areas here in the, in the southern parts. Now the team compared the 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 index uh, as a proxy for health to the entire uh, uh, for the entire Chandelier Island system to a major uh, uh, lever on the environment to in the Chandelier Sound water discharge from the Mississippi River. Now river runoff and precipitation, which contributes to river to uh, uh, which also contributes to runoff. Uh, should be the first uh, uh, the first order uh, control on salinity. And historically, it seems that the SAB fair seems to do better in lower salinity or fresher water environment. This has major implications for ecosystem changes that will result from installation of uh, probably more river diversion projects in the lower Mississippi River uh, in the in the upcoming decades. Now, here are some uh, concluding remarks uh, about this uh, session. So the accuracy of seagrass and other submerged aquatic vegetation mapping will depend on the method methodological factors, uh, such as the use of the appropriate water column correction algorithm, cloud cover correction, the incorporation of other uh, physical, biological, chemical, and geological considerations into the analysis. And despite some efforts at local and regional levers, uh, spectral libraries of submerged aquatic vegetation are still very limited and in need of expansion. And this should include data that incorporates, for instance, the presence of, or absence of IP bions or how spectral signatures are affected with these. And there's a need for standardizing all these uh, field collection, field data collection uh, methods for better use. And current satellite data can be used for mapping uh, aquatic vegetation on different levels. But with the incorporation of new satellite and airborne-based hyperspectral imagery uh, at increased spatial and spectral resolutions may prove useful uh, when mapping different, different species or different groups of aquatic vegetation and other benthic components. 
Now, as a reminder, here are uh, my email and Amber's email. Uh, as our contacts for this webinar. And also, I would like to encourage you to follow us on Twitter and also to look into the RCET website to see for to look for other other uh, webinars uh, of your interest, and also to consult our sister programs, Develop and Servir, uh, as well. Now, thank you very much for your time. Let's go there now into the question and answer session. All right, let's go into the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> let's see if uh, our guys can share the screen there um, with the Q&A document. We've been, I've been answering a couple of them uh, already. Very, very interesting questions. Again, thank you so much for uh, participating on this uh, webinar. And uh, yeah, let's go into some of the some of the some of the questions and the, the minutes that we have left. Mm, we have uh, quite some time, so we can go over uh, uh, over these. And uh, but then eventually, if if there's any that uh, for whatever reason you you uh, you, uh, you uh, wrote in the on the uh, on the uh, questions box there, and we weren't able to answer it, we uh, feel free to send us an email and. Um, We'll make sure to answer uh, those as well. Or if there are any that uh, that for for time constraints we're not able to answer now, we we will uh, in the in the final Q and A uh, document. So let's go into the first one. The first one says, "How deep can the satellite look into the water? Is the water depth visual visualized by satellites the same as the uh, the one with the naked eye?" Well, how deep the satellites? Sensors can detect a signal in the ocean will will depend highly, as as I mentioned um, during the webinar, on the concentration of the different constituents in the water working within the water column, mean, meaning uh, phytoplankton, uh, color distort of presence of color distort organic matter, uh, particulate matter, including sediments, and um, and others. So, for instance, in coastal areas, there's usually uh, a higher influence of these constituents, and as such, as, as, as there's a higher influence because, again, because uh, at the same time, because of the influence of of uh, of uh, uh, land-based uh, sources, such as uh, sediments coming from the from rivers and and others, and. Uh, and then the depth at which we can detect anything uh, will be uh, more limited. Um, whereas in clear coastal areas, such as uh, those that you can some you, you can see sometimes in in parts of the tropics, um, there's usually usually a good estimate can be with satellite data maybe around 10, 20 meters uh, max. Typically beyond that, it's there's very little that you can detect. Um, even in clear waters, and uh, and 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 then obviously in in areas that are more affected by sediments and other factors, the the depth is reduced considerably, uh, even to, to to centimeters. There's, there's areas where you can you can't see anything, any of the of, of the bottom. Uh, and we, I've been diving in very turbid waters where I can barely see my hands. So obviously, uh, a satellite will not detect any anything, you know, below that. And uh, and in the open ocean, uh, 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 it's actually the the opposite. There's the water itself as the one that uh, one of the major factors that affects the presentation of light. And uh, as we showed here in, in one of the graphs, water absorbs absorbs heavily in the red and the near infrared regions. Uh, of the spectrum, and uh, and then uh, that it's uh, that's why we see the the open ocean is blue or, or dark blue. It's just because the main, one of the, the major constituent there is the water itself, and not necessarily the presence or absence or, or phytoplankton, CDOM, or, or other or other type of materials either uh, dissolve or, or particulate in the water column. All right, let's go to uh, question number two. Uh, 
please describe the main difference between tidal salt marshes and seagrasses? It's confusing. It is. It is confusing, and uh, and uh, and the reason is that uh, in, in many areas, uh, tidal or salt marshes, marsh ecosystems can also contain uh, not uh, can can contain seagrasses and can contain other plant species as well. Uh, maybe even floating aquatic vegetation that is already submerged. Um, but in, in many areas, a uh, uh, very basic, uh, let's say, geographic um, uh, distinction between them is that in many tropical areas, in particular, um, not necessarily apply to apply to temperate waters, but in, in many tropical areas, seagrass meadows or seagrass beds can be found separated from the coastline and, and most times even associated with uh, with coral reef ecosystems for instance um, there you will see during particularly in session three where, where, where we talk about sargasso you will see that uh, and some some aerial photos and, and images from coral reefs in puerto rico where you can actually uh, you can see that you can see that the, some of the seagrass beds are actually within the coral reef itself, so they're part of the coral reef uh, ecosystem. So yes, in many areas, seagrasses are an important venting component of salt marshes, but not necessarily. Uh, it depends on, on on where you are on the planet. All right, number three. Let's see. Number three, okay. In Lake Victoria, we have an invasive uh, aquatic vegetation called uh, hyacinth, hyacinth, of course. Uh, this this is a this is a, a a big issue in Lake Victoria. It has been for for, for some years, and uh, I would like to know where we can classify them amongst the three so much aquatic vegetation we have discussed. So, so I think the question is more to how we can we can separate them. Um, and this is a very interesting question, not, not an easy one to, to, to answer. Um, uh, Hyacinths will have a very similar spectral signal as seagrasses, um, because they're green plants, but not necessarily as uh, sargassum or kelp forest. Um, as a starting point, um, all three that we mentioned during this webinar, they're, they're uh, strictly marine species. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, obviously, you know, kelp or, or sargassum will not be there. But uh, but uh, and uh, one, I do want to mention that, in, at least in the case of kelps and sargassum, as we will see in the next two sessions of this uh, webinar series, they're both brown algae, and therefore their spectral signal will be different from that of green plants, whether they are seagrasses or hyacinths. In, in, and uh mentioning this question or any other green plant and uh and they will have a higher reflectance around the 600 to 700 nanometers um because of the presence of other uh photosynthetic or, or photoprotective pig pigments uh like carotenes and uh, some xanthophylls as well and uh which are which are more dominant than, than even the than chlorophyll, chlorophyll themselves um, Whereas in the, in the case of green plants, they have the, dens the distinctive peak around around 550 nanometers or so. So in the green region, which uh, gives them the you know the, the, the particular green color, and this is mostly because in the case of, of uh, green plants and the chlorophyll chlorophylls, uh, uh, chlorophyll A in particular, and and some others, uh, depending on, on on the species, they uh, they are uh, the ones that are uh, the, that, that absorb the, the more practically in the in the blue and, and in the red region of the spectrum as well. Okay, let's uh, move into question number four. If one is to monitor the rate of degradation, um, okay, let's see. If one is to monitor the rate of the of degradation of coral reefs. Which satellite imagery is most recommended? Okay, so um, because of the high 
heterogeneity of coral reefs, meaning that uh, there's a lot of different benthic components in, in, a, in a very small area. There could be a lot of benthic components in a very small area. The use of, of satellite imagery for benthic assessments is, is a bit hard, uh, has proven to be a bit hard. And nonetheless, major components like corals, separating major components like coral sand or algae or coral sand or seagrass, um, can be they can be discriminated with, with particularly with, with high spatial resolution data and and even with with, with hyperspectral data uh, as well collected uh, most times with, with with an airborne uh, uh, sensor. Um, one approach uh, used by many researchers is uh, to use satellite data not necessarily for assessing the condition of the benthic communities, but to evaluate the water quality at or around the reefs and use it either as a proxy for uh, reef condition or to uh, correlate it with, uh, with data collected by, in the field by, by divers as well. Um, I believe there is a, there's a recent paper by, by, by Anto Decker uh, uh, from Australia who, uh, and, uh, and some uh, colleagues and they they actually assess the, the the differences in the in the water uh, constituents um, around or, or on top of the reefs and, and see and whether there's a whether there was a yeah, there was a difference or not and I'll, I'll I'll make sure in the final document that I will I'll, I'll find that uh, that uh, reference and I, I will include that this reference uh, uh, also because it's, it's it was fairly recent it was I think it was this this year that was published okay uh, five what does PMSC stand for I'm not sure about what it, what I don't recall mentioning that so we'll we'll, we'll skip that and uh, but if, 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 if when I go back again to the to, to the to the webinar I can I can I can follow it with this and if, if need be. Uh, data from number six from, from Terra satellites and, and SWOMI MPP are released for studies. If so, where do you get them? First, all NASA data are free. And uh, and that's also the, the, uh, the case for most of the uh, European Space Agency data as well. Um, from SWOMI MPP, first, uh, I believe the person would be more interested in the in in the BIRS data, uh, most likely for ocean coral data, and for both Terra, uh, Terra, Aqua, uh, BIRS, uh, etc., uh, a good starting point is to go to the ocean color uh, website uh, there, and uh, and you can do you can do a search there and and, and do a request and, and download it. Okay, and, and by the way, we uh, yeah we can um, uh, we we will we last year we did a we did a two webinars on the transition from MODIS to VIRS, um, and and that way in that one particularly in the in both of them but uh, but in the first one which is the one that I that I participated at we with we, with my colleagues Amita Meta and Sean McCartney we. We went into details of uh, there was a demo of how how to request the data and download the data from both uh, 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 Modis and, and Verse. So definitely take a look at that uh, at that webinar from from last year. If we can include the uh, the link to that to that webinar, that'd be great. And uh, and, and yeah, it, it's, it it gives you step by step. Uh, a process of how to how to access that, uh, those. So that's a that's a really good resource. Okay, um, which tools are used to diagram three D spectra? I'm not sure what the what the person meant by by three D spectra. Um, the so if, if yeah, if, if, the, if the person want to, you know, uh, send me an email and to, just to clarify a little bit more, um, then I can I can follow up uh, follow with with that with that person. But uh, but I know that for instance, 
sorry, might not, what I'm saying, what I'm going to say, it's not, might not be related to the to the to the to the person's question, but it, but it's a it's a good piece of information. For for benthic mapping, there's a technique called uh, structure for motion, and that was developed some years ago, and um, by colleagues from 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 the U.S. Geological Survey and others. And it uses uh, high-resolution photographic imagery collected by either divers or ROVs, uh, remotely operated vehicles underwater. And, and then it builds a, a 3D reconstruction of the bottom. And at Ames, um, the, um, the person who was the manager of the director of the uh, Laboratory for Advanced Sensing, uh, he uh, developed a technique called fluid lensing that uses uh, NASA supercomputer and, and, and complex algorithms to basically remove the water column from the imagery and then have a much better delineation of the bottom features. Um, to, 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 that's to, in very clear areas, you can, can get up to uh, about, I think the latest was about, about 45, deep, 45 feet or something like that. Uh, and uh, and I want to mention also that, that, that uh, we also developed a citizen science tool where users can map uh, coral reefs in in 2D and 3D image composites. And it's called NemoNet. Um, and here, there's a link for for NemoNet. It's a, it's a, it's available for. It was originally available for uh, iPads and iPhones. Now, so I believe it's also available for Androids. And you can download it for free either through the Apple Store or the Google Store. And uh, and feel free to use it. It's, and whatever you can contribute to it, it's actually uh, helpful. You'll be contributing as a citizen science scientist. Okay, um, uh, how oil spills uh, affect um, uh, the collection of, of data? From a satellite or airborne point of view, the oil spills, obviously depending on, on their extension, um, they will definitely impede the the visualization of, of bottom features, like uh, super, including so much aquatic vegetation and, and others, um, for for obvious reasons. So so in this case, it's most uh, it's, uh, it's uh, recommended to you, you can use the satellite imagery to map the extent of the of the oil spill, and then um, and then maybe follow uh, through time uh, if there's imagery available. Um, and you can use uh, some some indices uh, to to follow on the condition of of the aquatic vegetation if they're you know shallow enough so that you can see it. Um, okay, where does the NDAVI work? Does NDAVI work even with vegetation in small shallow lakes, for example? It may. Uh, it it will depend on the on the on the on the size of the of your study site and obviously it will depend then on the on the spatial resolution of the imagery that you're looking at um, but there's a lot a lot of times with uh, with satellite data in particular the, the spatial resolution is, is, a, is a very key component and uh, because particularly in small lakes or, or rivers or, 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 or similar uh, uh, <clears throat> water bodies, the, the the pixels that are that are uh, closer to the um, to the to the to the, to the shoreline or, or um, they will be affected um, if uh, by the by the presence of or just of the land that, that that surrounds the lakes or or the rivers um, and and that is why it's uh, it's very important to to be sure that uh, when, for whenever you, you you select a particular picture for the AVI or any kind of any other kind of index, in, uh, index make sure that that pixel is uh, it's only composed of uh, it's a water pixel. It's it doesn't there's no other features that may affect the 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 signal that you get from the from the pixel. Otherwise, you're gonna, gonna you're gonna get a mixed signal. Composed of whatever is uh, the water, uh, <clears throat> uh, the the water um, uh, data that it's uh, uh, that it's obtained from the from the sensor, from, and also the uh, the land component as well. So uh, that one that one will will have an artifact uh, just because of the 
or the influence of the land. Okay, are there any plans for number 10? Any plans of um, of uh, conducting training regarding seagrass detection using machine learning techniques? That is a very good suggestion. As I as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is this was intended to be a very uh, an introductory webinar. Um, so obviously we're not we don't go into machine learning on, or anything like that, but uh, but it's a it's a very it's a very good suggestion for for a future uh, either intermediate or or advanced level uh, RSET webinar. So well, thank you for for the idea. We'll we'll definitely consider it in the in the future. Okay, can we use this this same approach for mangrove monitoring? Mangroves are coastal uh, species, so it's a uh, it's, it's a bit easier because obviously they're not they're not submerged at least the the the, the, the leaves and, and and branches to 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 most extent. Um, and uh, and so, so you can use for mangroves. A lot of people use uh, um, typical indices like like uh, NDVI and others to 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 have an idea on the condition and the health of the mangroves. There's a uh, our our colleagues here from from RCET are also including there uh, the link for a training that we did uh, <clears throat> some a little a little bit ago. Um, that uh, that uh, that has a has a, a pretty heavy mangrove component, so make so that's uh that's that's one of them. Um, also, a couple of years ago, we did a we did a training, and that was with with SAR, um, <clears throat> and uh, and that one uh, also had a whole section that was dedicated to mangroves. So uh, that's also uh, it's, it's another training that you can take a look at it, and uh, and I think we also went into some something of mangrove in, in our in our previous coastal webinar, uh, also. So yeah, there's 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 a lot of uh, or at least there's there's several also trainings that, that have not already covered that topic, and I would I would encourage you to 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 go on and, and take a look at it at them, and. Uh, what do you think on the use of UAVs and their IR and blue sensor and uh, sensors in this uh, kind of survey? And, uh, and probably the uh, the following question is also kind of re also related to it. Um, <clears throat> the uh, there's there's a uh, Next, next, and in the next session, we there's a, we have a we're going to talk very very briefly about about some sensors. Uh, the next session is on kelps, but but we're going to cover. We have a slide where we we will we will show some of the some of the new uh, the new sensors that are that have been built for for UAV purposes. So so to so be used on drones, and uh, and those are. I think we're going to mention one that is multispectral, the other one is hyperspectral. Um, so there's a lot of development on this uh, on this area of using UAVs and uh, and, and, and new technologies uh, that can that can be flown in UAVs uh, for this kind of survey. Um, remember that when you use there's, there's other considerations that you have to take into account when you use a uh, UAV data. Um, um, mainly the just the uh, you have to do some you may have to do some corrections and there's you, you will have a high re, high spatial resolution image for sure uh, maybe a, a centimeter scale uh, uh, resolution but you will you need to consider uh, the, the um, factors that affect just the just the, the just the flying the the UAVs over over uh, any area. Uh, also, so, it's, so it might be some some additional geo rectification that you need to do before you may you are even able to to do the analysis. Um, hopefully, the the if they, if they have um, the 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 resolution and the and a um, you know, very high dynamic range as well. So it's it's uh, they potentially these these sensors can can also be used for 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 these similar studies. 
um, in the in session three, uh, my some of my colleagues will go over the use of some of these some drones for uh, for sargassum mapping. Uh, also, so stay tuned for that. So in the next one, the what is the NBAVI index and uh, and what is it useful for? Uh, and is it uh, satellite-based in the index? Um, it was developed for satellites. The NBAVI um, is, is particularly useful for um, for sea we uh, the for sea monitoring. We that was uh, uh, that we use in a, as I mentioned in the in a recent. Uh, uh, that's a developed project, which I'm one of the science advisors, and uh, and in this case, uh, in this case, uh, the 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 reason why we use the NDAVI was because the these seagrasses were uh, very 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 shallow areas, even exposed uh, to the uh, to the to the water surface, so there wasn't the there was not necessarily the problem of using the NIR the near infrared band. Uh, for for analysis, um, which is heavily affected by by the water itself. So so if the if the seagrasses would have been uh, like a meter or something underwater, we would not have been able to to use it. So use it uh, most likely because it's because uh, because it's already uh, <clears throat> affected by by the 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 absorption of the water itself. The, the, um, but in, but uh, but the uh, NDAVI as uh, as opposed to to NDVI, NDVI uses the NIR and, and red bands. NDAVI uses the NIR, NIR and the blue bands uh, also. And and uh, as I mentioned, in the in plants, you will have uh, in plant, green plants in particular have chlorophyll A. Chlorophyll A absorbs heavily in the blue region. As opposed to in the near infrared region, where you have well, uh, the, the you know the red edge and the and the and the, the high reflectance in the in the near near infrared region, region, and that is why we choose we choose this particular index uh, over other uh, other types. And it turned out that it that it uh, that it provided a really good uh, estimation of the of the coverage of seagrasses in that particular area. Again, these are seagrass uh, meadows that are pretty much exposed. Um, through through most of the year, so it was uh, it was uh, uh, it was much uh, simpler uh, to use that uh, in that region, uh, in in particular in, in Louisiana in this case. What is the limit, uh, the depth limit of a sensor? On a web, uh, okay, yeah. What is What is the the limit, the depth limit using a sensor such as Landsat or Sentinel in the water, and at what depth will there be vegetation available normally? Yeah, like I said, uh, it will depend on the it will depend on on how clear or how turbid the water is, in, uh, particularly in coastal areas. In in the we're, we're talking at a max of maybe 10, 20 meters if 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 it's really really clear, most likely ten. Uh, or even less than that, uh, but there will be, depending on the type of vegetation that you're looking at. And again, we we only cover we only cover only covering seagrasses, kelps, and, and, and sargassum in this in this series. But uh, but uh, as, uh, as our uh, audience uh, knows, there's a lot of uh, there's there's other types of, of algae that live even in deeper areas. Red algae, for instance. That may live in, in much deeper uh, zones. Those can most likely will not be able to, to be detected. So uh, uh, vegetation will 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 grow depending in in a, in a specific area, depending on what are the conditions in the water column itself. Um, if there's a lot of if there's a high turbidity in the area, uh, just because the, the there's there's a the, the light regime is affected, and there's not that much photons uh, reaching the the the, the bentos, and the the vegetation will be limited. In other areas where the where the water is more clear, the, the vegetation might be might have a much higher coverage than than uh, um, than in turbid waters. Is it possible, 15, possible to identify the river mouth area? 
uh, bathymetry using optical or microwave uh, remote sensing techniques. If possible, can you tell me the tool? That is a good question. I don't know the answer of that. Um, I know that, that uh, other techniques like LiDAR uh, has have been used uh, to, to assess bathymetry or to map bathymetry of, of, of specific areas. Um, but uh, but we'll look into this and uh, do a little bit of research. I and mean, if I find anything that, that might be useful, we'll, we'll include it here in the document. All right, we're running out of time, so we'll just go. Let's just do what one more, and then we'll make sure that uh, we that we uh, answer the rest uh, in the in the final document. Does the presence of phytoplankton affect the seagrass detection? Yes, of course. It, it affects uh, the detection of seagrass um, mostly because uh, both of them will have chlorophyll as, a, as their main pigment and, uh, and other types of, uh, of photosynthetic pigments um, as well. So yes, it, it, it is it's really important to, to do a full or, or, or very thorough uh, water quality characterization and, uh, in, the, in the area. And, and yes, depending on on, on how many uh, uh, constituents are in the water, including not only phytoplankton, but CDOM, sediments, and others, um, that will be the determinant of whether you're even able to, to detect the uh, sea grasses in, 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 even in shallow waters um, um, in, the, uh, in the coastal zone. So yes, definitely the, the phytoplankton, the presence of phytoplankton and, and uh, <clears throat> And the different the species or groups or functional types will affect uh, the detection of seagrasses and, and other types of submerged aquatic vegetation and, and, and even other types of benthic components uh, in, in, in shallow uh, coastal ecosystems. Okay, so um, we're going to go again, we're going to go over the, the, the rest of the questions in the final document, make sure that we uh, assess them. And uh, and uh, and then uh, stay tuned for for uh, next Thursday for the session two, where we're gonna cover uh, uh, most. It's gonna it's mostly dedicated to to kelps uh, analysis, and we also have two short demos on one on floating forest, which is a citizen science tool for for kelp detection, and another one. The other one is a kelp watch. Um, where people can easily download data, Landsat-based data from, from more than 30 years. Uh, <clears throat> so stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for the participation today. And uh, um, we'll see you uh, in quotes uh, and on Thursday. Have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>